Special shout out to Jellico rocking with us today. We're getting ready to go get up with Jew Man. I know that Jew Man has definitely shared some very crazy stories with us about what he was doing while in prison, and I'm quite sure that that doesn't sit well with everybody. Uh, you know, when I heard it, it's tough to hear, and I'm sure Jellico probably felt the same way, and I'm sure a lot of you felt the same way as well, but the fact of the matter is, is Y'all, this is after prison show, and this is as real as it gets. Yeah. And there's one thing that you can't deny, and that is in prison, the sort of stuff that Jew Man was sharing with us is the sort of stuff that can and does happen. Every day. People have their way that they go about things, things that they get involved with. Some guys are the predators. Some guys are the prey. And in this particular case, Jew man was a predator. He was preying on weaker prisoners. And as he says, in most cases, or pretty much in all cases, those were white guys. It's the facts of life. It's the facts of prison life. That type of stuff happens. We've never had an individual on after prison show who has been somebody who got into this type of stuff or somebody who's been willing to talk about this type of stuff. I can't sit here and sugarcoat it. I can't sit here and make it sound better than it is because there's no way to do so and I would never attempt to do so. We bring you guys very- Authentic. I yeah. mean, you got, we gotta keep it real, man. That's a great way to word it right there, Jellico. Authentic, as real as it gets. Well, one thing that I would like to throw into this, if there's any type of justification at all, and there probably isn't, is the fact that you have to keep this in mind as well. Uh, this guy, was an individual who expected to be spending the rest of his life in prison. In that type of a situation, it's gonna be a lot more real. It's gonna be a lot more gritty and it's gonna be a lot more dog eat dog. Only the strong survive. You know, Jew Man has mentioned to us before that he's a smaller guy and he has what he refers to as a small man complex. And maybe in some way that played a part in the things that he was doing. But regardless, it is what it is. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to bring you this super gritty story. And this guy would, in fact, end up with a second chance at life because of changes that were made to the three strike law. And I am quite certain that when this guy realized that he was going to be going home, yeah. his whole demeanor and his way of being had to have changed. Because Jellico knows this guy. I was about to say, his demeanor wasn't a, a hard individual or anything like that when I met him. But that's the thing. That's what happens when people do time and they realize they're going home. Things People change toward the end or realize they're getting short and stuff like that. I mean, I wild out the first time I, you know, in the jails, you know, before I even get sentenced. I don't know what I'm going to do or what I'm going to go. I've been in fights, you know what I'm saying? I played poker. So, I mean, it's all part of the... The process of learning how to do time you know you, you, there's no rule book to this you know there I mean there's no you know method to the madness it's just you know when it you're angry you're angry when you get there man I'm quite certain that this guy's mind state the things that he was doing changed when he realized he was getting a second chance at life and today we're going to meet with Jew man again and we're going to talk about especially the transition between going from a guy who was serving the rest of his life in prison to now getting ready to go home. Those, those last two years or however long that it was while he was at uh, St. Bride's with you at a reentry facility or a facility that offered reentry. Because not only did Jellico know him from yeah. St. Bride's, Corso knew him as well. They slept beside each other. And Corso and Jew Man were were cool yes they were they slept right across from me literally Jew man was across from me and corso was beside him so like literally this circle of individuals we brought to after prison show literally bunked right side next. next to each other we drank coffee together you know and stuff like that and you know we broke bread we ate together everybody you know just you know doing time we're getting ready to go meet with Jew man uh, we're gonna hear more of his story especially that transition when does it happen what was it like going from life in prison to the possibility, uh, not the possibility, the reality that you're getting ready to get released. And also, real quick to throw in, this isn't gonna be today, but this is definitely upcoming. Extortion was a huge thing that Jew Man shared with us in the last video with him. Well, Jellico has a story yeah. of a time when somebody tried to extort him, and Corso does as well. And we're gonna be bringing you guys those stories uh, real soon, but today, well, I've said it twice already. We're going to go see Jew Man 
we're going to learn some more about his prison story. So, Jew man, I want to first start by saying that I greatly appreciate you taking the time to meet with us again today. Yes, sir. We have been beginning to hear your story with hopes to be working with you moving forward. We've spent quite a bit of time talking about your past, mm. what led you to prison, what prison life was like for you. And this is probably going to be the last day that we stay in the past because ultimately us working with you is about what your life is going to be like after prison. And I want to just say that I'm very grateful for your willingness to, to talk about the things that you have thus far. The last time that we got with you and we filmed with you, you know, we heard some very gritty stories from you. And that's something that we don't shy away from here. Mm. The fact of the matter is, is, in prison, it's survive or be taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's interesting to get your perspective as pretty much the predator taking advantage of weaker individuals. Right. Some people may not like that, but that's the reality of prison. Reality, that's the reality that I experienced, you know. Other people may have, you know, experienced prison differently. You know, that was how I experienced it. Prison life is different from for everybody, from man to man. And know? obviously you weren't the only person who was extorting, robbing other prisoners. I mean, this is just stuff that happens on a day-to-day -day in prison. This is thing that just happened on a day-to-day -day basis, man. You know, nothing personal, but, you know, for a lot of times, you know, that was how I had to survive. You know, I went a few years without a job, you know, maybe it was because I didn't put in, um, you know, the energy to get a job, you know, during that time, you know, little prison jobs, houseman job or whatever. But, you know, that was how I survived most of the time, man. You know, we had a, a really good conversation off of camera, and I want to kind of reiterate some of the things that we talked about in this video right here. And one of the things that we talked about was how you shared with us that when you would rob an individual, there would be violence that would take place with that, whether it was a stabbing, whether it was a beating. And I asked you specifically, you know, when you would go into a situation to rob an individual, uh, was your intention to kill? Was concern for life something that you thought about? Yeah, it was something I thought about, you know, um... It was never my intention to kill nobody whenever I went into a situation like that. You know, uh, you know, things just happen. The individual may have been bigger than I am. Well, most of the time they've been bigger than I am. You, know, you see, it, I'm a small man. But that was my way, you know, to hit them with that thing first and let them know that I'm for real, that I'm serious. It wasn't never, you know, my intention to try to kill nobody. I just wanted to make a point. I want to really go into like how long would this type of stuff take place how long were you would you engage in the robbery and there would be a point that you would ultimately reach where you would pretty much change how you were living in prison you know like i say when i, I first went to prison in 88 1988 i lived that type of lifestyle from that time from June of 88 because that was I say June of 88 because that was the time that that was the month that I actually got to prison from receiving June 28th of 1988 day one you know that was you know what I was into coming from receiving you know my mentality was already there I would say you know my life kind of changed you know in 03 behind a different experience. Actually have somebody die in your arms, you know, that, that you trying to help. I was trying to help the guy, you know what I mean? But to actually have that happen while trying to help him, I think it kind of done something to my psyche. Had somebody die behind, you know, me robbing them, or me fighting them, or whatever, you know, stabbing them or something. I don't think it would have had the same type of effect on me as having a friend, a so-called friend, somebody that I associated with, you know, die like that. Not saying that I didn't have or I don't have remorse, you know, for 
you know, the things, that, you know, that I've done, robbing people or, or whatever, extortion thing, it's just different because I actually was a friend with this guy that died. And you shared the story of this situation with us previously. Uh, this was the incident that took place on the basketball court where the guy uh, had a brain aneurysm and you thought that he was having a stroke. I thought he was having a seizure, you know. And what I know about seizures is that they say you're supposed to turn a guy or the person over, I think, on their back and stick your finger if you don't have a, a, a spoon or something to stick to hold their tongue down to stop them from swallowing their tongue. So that's what I called myself doing, turning him over on his back, sticking my, trying to open his mouth and stick my finger in there to hold his tongue down, not really knowing that when he fell and hit his chin on the clamp, on you know, uh, um, the clamp on the gate with it, with a gate door open up the gate open up. They had these big clamps down the bottom, and when he fell, he he hit his chin and it broke his jaw. Me not knowing what you know that his jaw was broke. You know, I'm I was forcing his his mouth open. While at the same time, he had his brain aneurysm. Eventually, he just choked on his own blood because I was, I put, held him over on his, on his back. And he looked up at me. I guess he was trying to tell me, you know, to stop order, you know, because he looked up at me and took his last breath and <sighs> like that, and his, he went out. Like, like I say, ultimately, that's what kind of changed my, my mentality. You know, when I started, I don't know, man. I just, I went into a different world. That incident right there would be something that would cause you to first begin to really stop doing the things that you were doing or maybe to just think about things a little more seriously, to see a friend of yours die. There's another thing that I really want to address in this video and really kind of clarify, and it was a, a story that you shared with me off camera, and that was your release date, how that changed mm. from 2027 to 2052 right. uh, because of an incident that would take place. And would you be willing to talk about that? Yeah. Um, you know, like I can see this was in, um, in 89, you know, 1989. I was in SIG you know, segregation for, you know, doing what I do, surviving the way I survive. We was going outside for wreck one morning. After they tell you come past and tell you to script down, uh, bend down and cough, you know, while you naked, put my clothes back on, I put, stuck my hand out the slot for him to put the handcuffs on and he put the little dog chain on me. And when he opened up the door, you let me out. It was like he was actually carrying a dog, you know, the way he was handling me with the dog chain, you know, and I didn't like that. So I, I pushed him up against the rail and we started struggling from there. You know, other police you know, officers came in to restrain me. They put me back in my cell. And when, when they put me back in my cell, uh, I just kind of took it to another level. You know, it won't over with me. So when the officer came back past, you know, feeding lunch or whatever, I can't remember actually what it was, but I do know that when he came past, when he opened up my slot for whatever reason it was, you know, it was on. I either threw some piss or some shit in his face or something, and you know, it just, every day, you know, it was just something. It was, coming in with the uh, with the shields, with the rag gear, chaining me down to the bed. You know, they had the rag gear on because I won't, anytime they open up that door, <laughs> you know, it was on. You know, it was just a fight. And, you know, a lot of time I was spent chained to the bed in four point strength, you know, chained to the bed, man. They would take my mattress out and all of those stuff, so but 
them that type of thing right there is what caused me to lose my good time. It went from 2027 to 2052. And like I say, you know, once you start down a path in prison, it's kind of hard to get off that path. The path that I was on, a destructive path, you know, it just, it was hard for me to get off it, you know, on all levels. How long would you end up spending back in isolation? During that time right there, behind that, you know, during that incident right there, it was about 18 months. When I got out, you know, guys thought I was, thought I had been got transferred. They forgot that I was even on the compound, man. And like I said, I had a brother and two uncles there. You know, they knew I was still there. But then uh, it has been, you know, other instances where I spent time, you know, like that in M building on the state farm, which I think I spent the most time. Cause I think I spent something like, oh man, 27 months, you know, going from Mecklenburg segregation and isolation back to State Farm uh, M building. So I think all together, you know, during that time, and that was 91 and 92, you know, um, that I spent that 27 months, you know. With the time that you served in isolation, was this the result of extortion and robbery? Yeah, yeah, it was. You know, uh, it, that that that's exactly what it was. Now, M building. My thing with M building, though, how, which made me stay so much, you know, spend so much time there, which they transferred me to Mecklenburg was that I was also taking little small contracts. It's one incident where this guy, he was from Chicago. It was a homosexual on account. It was also from Chicago. He felt like that was his homeboy. He wanted him, you know, they guess they didn't talk or they knew each other or something. But it was this guy from DC that had the homosexual, that had the boy that was, you know, so, this guy was, you know, like I say, I was, I was surviving, you know what I mean, doing what I had to do to survive. So this guy, you know, wanted to pay me to get rid of this guy so that he can have the boy, had his homosexual. I think he paid me something like, um, oh man, he paid me something like a, a half ounce of reefer and bought me a pair of uh, pair of uh, British night boots. <laughs> Picture that, me wearing some British night boots. Yeah, that's what he gave me, uh, a half ounce reef and bought me a pair of British night boots in which I ain't never get the boots because I got locked up. But anyway, he didn't want me to get rid of the guy my way. My way was, you know, put the knife in my hand and go do what I got to do to him. Get him off the yard that way. They, Administration felt like somebody was trying to kill you. They were gonna get you off the yard, you know. I'm gonna speak about it because it's it's done and over with now. But you know, I I I, I I'm not incriminating myself. But anyway, the guy gave me a, a lotion bottle full of paint thinner, put some newspaper in it, you know, and I spread it out, you know, cut it up, tore the, you know, and uh, the guy slept on the 300 till. You know, those were single cells. So five, I slept down on the bottom floor, A tier, that was double man cell. So 5.30 that morning, when the officers pulled the levers that opened up all the cells, I just walked around on 200, then went up on the 300 tier. You know, this is 5.30 in the morning. As I approached the guy's cell, I lit the newspaper. On the state farm, they got bars up on the, you know, on the cells. You know, these are jail bars. They not the prison doors that you got now, you know, in prison, the slider doors, and these were prison uh, with the bars. And a lot of time, guys would sleep with a padlock on the outside of their door. You know, because you had, first thing in the morning, you had guys coming, creeping in your cell, 
stealing your shit while you sleep, or if you had enemies, you know, guys would creep up in there and stab you, beat you down with a lock or whatever. So a lot of time, guys will sleep with a padlock on their door, and that's what the case with this guy. So when I walked past, you know, his cell, as I approached his cell, I lit the, uh, lit the newspaper and walked past and tossed the lotion bottle full of paint, you know, in the cell. And immediately, you know, because I tossed it on the bed, and immediately his cell went up in flames. During this, at the time, that was temp, attempted murder. At, but at the time, I just wasn't thinking. But his cell went up in flames and everything. Uh, man, I, I thank God, though, because the guy wasn't even in the cell. He was down there at Pier Cause. So God was on that man's side, but he wasn't even he wasn't in the cell. He, he was downstairs in the basement, you know, on State Farm. Their medical is in the basement, and that's where he was at 5.30 in the morning. He went to peer call. Like I say, man, I thank God, you know what I mean, that it turned out that way because, you know, none of that, you know, after it happened, you know, I realized that, man, I tried to kill the guy. I, that was attempt murder. You know, I lasted on the yard after that incident right there, about two weeks, you know, Everybody started talking and my name started circulating and, you know, somebody seen me up there and I got locked up for it. And that's what I stayed those 27 months in SIG for. The guy cell that I set on fire, I ran into him on Greenville. I was at medical. One night they just called me the medical, man. I hadn't put in to go to medical for nothing, you know. and uh. It was about 8 o'clock that night. So while I'm sitting on it, you know, on a little thing, the little bench, letting the nurse check me out, she put doing a little physical, you know, I kind of looked towards my right, you know, at the little window, and I see the guy standing outside the, the window. He got a lieutenant and a sergeant with him. And they looking at me. And I was like, man, whoa. You know, the moment I seen him, I already knew what it was, you know. And that feeling just came back to me, man. I can't get away from it, you know what I mean? You know, I just can't get away from it, man, that, that, that you know, how lucky I was that he won't in the cell, you know. But at the same time, I'm like, man, he's snitching on me. Was this, this before or after you went to the hole for the 24 months? Not about uh, 27 months. This is um, this is after, you know. But like I say, because this was a couple years later that I ran into this guy. This was on Greensville that I ran into this guy. And I was back there in SIG on Greenville for the same thing, extortion, robbing, because I got on Greenville and I started doing the same thing. You know, so I was like, man, this guy sitting there snitching on me. You know, he out standing outside the medical department, looking through the window at me, pointing me out to a lieutenant and a, uh, and a sergeant. But that's what it was, man. And, uh, you know, like I say, man, I was just doing little things like that to survive prison, man. You know, to eat, you know. Uh, and really during that time, on the state farm in 91, 92. You know, I, man, I was just kind of doing a little bad, you know. Sad to say, I was doing a little bad, man. So taking contracts and robbing people or whatever, man, that's what I, you know, <laughs> that's what I had to do. I mean, we could stay on this topic for days or probably even weeks. And again, your story is just edge of your seat to listen to, but I do want to move on because again, we've addressed the past. I want to get to this point in your life, your, your prison life first, of you receiving the news that you know, you're know you gonna get another chance at life. What year was this and what was this feeling like when, and how did this happen? Like how did you find out that from your release date being 2052, 
did you find out that you were going to be parole eligible and that you were going to be getting released? I think I got my good time back around both. Hmm. 2012, and they gave me 20 for 30. Because like I say, after 2003, you know, when that incident with a guy died, I just started, you know, mellowing out, you know, a little bit, man. I stopped doing the things that, you know, I was doing, and I ended up getting my good time back, you know, because of me mellowing out in 2012. I think I ended up with 20 for 30 again, and that sent my date from 2052 back to its original date, which was 2027. And then I ended up with a dirty urine. And the moment I got my uh, good time back, man, and moved my date from 2052 back to 2027, I catch a dirty urine and they take it all back. So it goes right back to 2052, man, behind a dirty urine charge. Now, 2013, I ended up with 2030 again. And from there, I just kind of held on to it, you know, for the rest of the way. So guys were telling me, man, at least you see daylight now. You see daylight, man. Start right need people. Start doing this and start doing that. And I was like, man, fuck that. I ain't doing nothing. I, I, I ripped up all my little legal work I had, but, you know, all my little uh, pre-sentence report, my sentencing order, I ripped up everything, man. I, I was just done with it. You know, I was like, man, this, you know, I ain't going to be here forever, you know. I don't know, you know, I, when I first got my, you know, the notification that I was going to start going back up for parole was in, uh, I think that was 2018. I had reached out to this guy, Tim Eberly, this news reporter for Virginia Pilot. Explained my story to him over the phone. He did the article. And before I knew it, I was getting paperwork in the mail from the parole board saying that, you know, um, I'm being reconsidered for parole, you know, for parole eligibility, they, meaning they were going to start taking me back up for parole. They took me back up for parole April the 2nd of 2018. Three weeks later, April the 19th, I was granted parole. But... I didn't actually find out, or I didn't actually know that I had made parole, or that it was giving me, granting me parole until September. I don't know why it took them so long, but when I got the paperwork, it said that they had gave me parole, or that I was granted parole April the 19th. You know, even though I was excited about it, you know, the reality of me you know, getting ready to go home or now got a chance of going home, man, it, it just, it didn't set in with me. I just went through the emotions, you know, up until the day that I was actually in the parking lot, the day that I got out. That's when the reality set in that, man, I'm, <laughs> I'm actually out. I ain't locked up no more. When I was in the parking lot with my brother and my niece, you know, where they came and got me, man. Even going through the re-entry program and all of this, it still wasn't real to me. You know, I used to tell guys all the time, man, it still don't seem like I'm getting out. You know, I, I'm just going through the motions. But that day, in which it was raining, the day that I got out, March 21st of 2019, you know, once I actually got in the car with my brother, man, and I left just something about leaving my state boots, my the state coat that they gave me, and everything out there in the parking lot. Something about that, man, made it real for me. Just leaving that shit right there made it real for me, man. That's when I actually realized, man, that I'm free. When I drove off, well, when we drove off and I 
enough of that shit right there. You know, <laughs> ain't no feeling like it, man. 